Section 20 of Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. Translated by H. P. Paul The Philosopher's Stone Far away towards the east, in India, which seemed in those days the world's end, stood the Tree of the Sun, a noble tree such as we have never seen, and perhaps never may see. The summit of this tree spread itself for miles like an entire forest, each of its smaller branches forming a complete tree palms beech trees pines plane trees and various other kinds which are found in all parts of the world were here like small branches shooting forth from the great tree while the larger boughs with their knots and curves formed valleys and hills clothed with velvety green and covered with flowers everywhere it was like a blooming meadow or a lovely garden here were birds from all quarters of the world assembled together, birds from the primeval forests of America, from the rose gardens of Damascus, and from the deserts of Africa, in which the elephant and the lion may boast of being the only rulers. Birds from the polar regions came flying here, and of course the stork and the swallow were not absent. But the birds were not the only living creatures. There were stags, squirrels, antelopes, and hundreds of other beautiful and light-footed animals here found a home. The summit of the tree was a wide-spreading garden, and in the midst of it, where the green boughs formed a kind of hill, stood a castle of crystal, with a view from it towards every quarter of heaven. Each tower was erected in the form of a lily, and within the stern was a winding staircase through which one could ascend to the top and step out upon the leaves as upon balconies. The calyx of the flower itself formed a most beautiful, glittering, circular hall, above which no other roof arose than the blue firmament and the sun and the stars. Just as much splendor but of another kind appeared below, in the wide halls of the castle. Here on the walls were reflected pictures of the world, which represented numerous and varied scenes of everything that took place daily, so that it was useless to read the newspapers, and indeed there were none to be obtained in this spot. All was to be seen in living pictures by those who wished it, and all would have been too much for even the wisest man, and this man dwelt here. His name is very difficult. You would not be able to pronounce it, so it may be omitted. He knew everything that a man on earth can know, or imagine. Every invention already in existence, or yet to be, was known to him, and much more. Still everything on earth has a limit. The wise King Solomon was not half so wise as this man. He could govern the powers of nature, and held sway over potent spirits. Even death itself was obliged to give him every morning a list of those who were to die during the day. And King Solomon himself had to die at last, and this fact it was which so often occupied the thoughts of this great man in the castle on the tree of the sun. He knew that he also, however high he might tower above other men in wisdom, must one day die. He knew that his children would fade away like the leaves of the forest and become dust. He saw the human race wither and fall like leaves from the tree. He saw new men come to fill their places. But the leaves that fell off never sprouted forth again. They crumbled to dust, or were absorbed into other plants. What happens to man? asked the wise man of himself, when touched by the angel of death. 
What can death be? The body decays in the soul. Yes, what is the soul? And whither does it go? To eternal life, says the comforting voice of religion. But what is this change? Where and how shall we exist? Above, in heaven, answers the pious man. It is there we hope to go. Above, repeated the wise man, fixing his eyes upon the moon and stars above him. He saw that to this earthly sphere above and below were constantly changing places, and that the position varied according to the spot on which a man found himself. He knew also that even if he ascended to the top of the highest mountain which rears its lofty summit on this earth, the air, which to us seems clear and transparent, would be dark and cloudy. The sun would have a coppery glow and send forth no rays, and our earth would lie beneath him wrapped in an orange-colored mist. How narrow are the limits which confine the bodily sight, and how little can be seen by the eye of the soul. How little do the wisest among us know of that which is so important to us all. In the most secret chamber of the castle lay the greatest treasure on earth, the Book of Truth. The wise men had read it through page after page. Every man may read in this book, but only in fragments. To many eyes the characters seem so mixed in confusion that the words cannot be distinguished. On certain pages the writing often appears so pale or so blurred that the page becomes a blank. The wiser a man becomes, the more he will read, and those who are wisest read most. The wise man knew how to unite the sunlight and the moonlight with the light of reason and the hidden powers of nature, and through this stronger light many things in the pages were made clear to him. But in the portion of the book entitled Life After Death, not a single point could he see distinctly. This pained him. Should he never be able here on earth to obtain a light by which everything written in the book of truth should become clear to him? Like the wise King Solomon, he understood the language of animals and could interpret their talk into song but that made him none the wiser. He found out the nature of plants and metals and their power in curing diseases and arresting death, but none to destroy death itself. In all created things within his reach, he sought the light that should shine upon the certainty of an eternal life, but he found it not. The book of truth lay open before him, but its pages were to him as blank paper. Christianity placed before him in the Bible a promise of eternal life, but he wanted to read it in his book, in which nothing on the subject appeared to be written. He had five children, four sons educated as the children of such a wise father should be, and a daughter, fair, gentle, and intelligent. But she was blind. Yet this deprivation appeared as nothing to her. Her father and brothers were outward eyes to her, and a vivid imagination made everything clear to her mental sight. The sons had never gone farther from the castle than the branches of the tree extended, and the sister had scarcely ever left home. They were happy children in that home of their childhood, the beautiful and fragrant tree of the sun. Like all children, they loved to hear stories related to them, and their father told them many things which other children would not have understood. But these were as clever as most grown-up people are among us. He explained to them what they saw in the pictures of life on the castle walls, the doings of man and the progress of events in all the lands of the earth, and the sons often expressed a wish that they could be present and take part in these great deeds. Then their father told them that in the world there was nothing but toil and difficulty, that it was not quite what it appeared to them as they looked upon it in their beautiful home. 
he spoke to them of the true the beautiful and the good and told them that these three held together in the world and by that union they became crystallized into a precious jewel clearer than a diamond of the first water a jewel whose splendor had a value even in the sight of god in whose brightness all things are dim this jewel was called the philosopher's stone he told them that by searching man could attain to a knowledge of the existence of god and that it was in the power of every man to discover the certainty that such a jewel as the philosopher's stone really existed this information would have been beyond the perception of other children but these children understood and others will learn to comprehend its meaning after a time they questioned their father about the true the beautiful and the good and he explained it to them in many ways he told them that god when he made man out of the dust of the earth touched his work five times leaving five intense feelings which we call the five senses through these the true the beautiful and the good are seen understood and perceived and through these they are valued protected and encouraged five senses have been given mentally and corporeally inwardly and outwardly to body and soul the children thought deeply on all these things and meditated upon them day and night then the eldest of the brothers dreamt a splendid dream strange to say not only the second brother but also the third and fourth brothers all dreamt exactly the same thing namely that each went out into the world to find the philosopher's stone each dreamt that he found it and that as he rode back on his swift horse in the morning dawn over the velvety green meadows to his home in the castle of his father that the stone gleamed from his forehead like a beaming light and threw such a bright radiance upon the pages of the book of truth that every word was illuminated which spoke of the life beyond the grave but the sister had no dream of going out into the wide world it never entered her mind her world was her father's house i shall ride forth into the wide world said the eldest brother i must try what life is like there as i mix with men i will practice only the good and true with these i will protect the beautiful much shall be changed for the better while i am there now these thoughts were great and daring as our thoughts generally are at home before we have gone out into the world and encountered its storms and tempests its thorns and its thistles in him and in all his brothers the five senses were highly cultivated inwardly and outwardly but each of them had one sense which in keenness and development surpassed the other four in the case of the eldest this preeminent sense was sight which he hoped would be of special service he had eyes for all times and all people eyes that could discover in the depths of the earth hidden treasures and look into the hearts of men as through a pane of glass he could read more than is often seen on the cheek that blushes or grows pale in the eye that droops or smiles stags and antelopes accompanied him to the western boundary of his home and there he found the wild swans these he followed and found himself far away in the north far from the land of his father which extended eastward to the ends of the earth how he opened his eyes with astonishment how many things were to be seen here and so different to the mere representation of pictures such as those in his father's house at first he nearly lost his eyes in astonishment at the rubbish and mockery brought forward to represent the beautiful but he kept his eyes and soon found full employment for them he wished to go thoroughly and honestly to work in his endeavor to understand the true the beautiful and the good but how were they represented in the world 
he observed that the wreath which rightly belonged to the beautiful was often given the hideous, that the good was often passed by unnoticed, while mediocrity was applauded when it should have been hissed. People look at the dress, not at the wearer, thought more of a name than of doing their duty, and trusted more to reputation than to real service. It was everywhere the same. I see I must make a regular attack on these things, said he, and he accordingly did not spare them. But while looking for the truth came the evil one, the father of lies, to intercept him. Gladly would the fiend have plucked out the eyes of this seer, but that would have been a too straightforward path for him. He works more cunningly. He allowed the young man to seek for and discover the beautiful and the good. But while he was contemplating them, the evil spirit blew one mote after another into each of his eyes, and such a proceeding would injure the strongest sight. Then he blew upon the motes, and they became beams, so that the clearness of his sight was gone, and the seer was like a blind man in the world, and had no longer any faith in it. He had lost his good opinion of the world, as well as of himself. And when a man gives up the world and himself, too, it is all over with him. All over! said the wild swan who flew across the sea to the east. All over, twittered the swallows, who were also flying eastward toward the tree of the sun. It was no good news which they carried home. I think the seer has been badly served, said the second brother, but the hearer may be more successful. This one possessed the sense of hearing to a very high degree. So acute was this sense that it was said he could hear the grass grow. He took a fond leave of all at home, and rode away, provided with good abilities and good intentions. The swallows escorted him, and he followed the swans till he found himself out in the world and far away from home. But he soon discovered that one may have too much of a good thing. His hearing was too fine. He not only heard the grass grow, but could hear every man's heart beat, whether in sorrow or in joy. The whole world was to him like a clockmaker's great workshop, in which all the clocks were going tick, tick, and all the turret clocks striking ding, dong. It was unbearable. For a long time his ears endured it, but at last all the noise and tumult became too much for one man to bear. There were rascally boys of sixty years old, for years alone do not make a man, who raised a tumult which might have made the hearer laugh, but for the applause which followed echoing through every street and house, and was even heard in country roads. Falsehood thrust itself forward and played the hypocrite. The bells on the fool's cap jingled and declared they were church bells, and the noise became so bad for the hearer that he thrust his fingers into his ears. Still he could hear false notes and bad singing, gossip and idle words, scandal and slander, groaning and moaning without and within. Heaven, help us! He thrust his fingers farther and farther into his ears, till at last the drums burst. And now he could hear nothing more of the true, the beautiful, and the good, for his hearing was to have been the means by which he hoped to acquire his knowledge. He became silent and suspicious, and at last trusted no one, not even himself and no longer hoping to find and bring home the costly jewel. He gave it up, and gave himself up too, which was worse than all. The birds in their flight towards the east carried the tidings, and the news reached the castle in the tree of the sun. I will try now, said the third brother, 
I have a keen nose. Now that was not a very elegant expression, but it was his way, and we must take him as he was. He had a cheerful temper and was, besides, a real poet. He could make many things appear poetical by the way in which he spoke of them, and ideas struck him long before they occurred to the minds of others. I can smell, he would say, and he attributed to the sense of smelling, which he possessed in a high degree, a great power in the region of the beautiful. I can smell, he would say, and many places are fragrant or beautiful according to the taste of the frequenters. One man feels at home in the atmosphere of the tavern, among the flaring tallow candles, and when the smell of spirits mingles with the fumes of bad tobacco, another prefers sitting amidst the overpowering scent of jasmine, or perfuming himself with scented olive oil. This man seeks the fresh sea breeze, while that one climbs the lofty mountain top to look down upon the busy life in miniature beneath him. As he spoke in this way, it seemed as if he had already been out in the world, as if he had already known and associated with man. But this experience was intuitive. It was the poetry within him, a gift from heaven bestowed on him in his cradle. He bade farewell to his parental roof in the tree of the sun, and departed on foot from the pleasant scenes that surrounded his home. Arrived at its confines, he mounted on the back of an ostrich, which runs faster than a horse, and afterwards, when he fell in with the wild swans, he swung himself on the strongest of them, for he loved change, and away he flew over the sea to distant lands, where there were great forests, deep lakes, lofty mountains, and proud cities. Wherever he came, it seemed as if sunshine traveled with him across the fields, for every flower Every bush exhaled a renewed fragrance as if conscious that a friend and protector was near, one who understood them and knew their value. The stunted rose bush shot forth twigs, unfolded its leaves, and bore the most beautiful roses. Everyone could see it, and even the black slimy wood snail noticed its beauty. I will give my seal to the flower said the snail. I have trailed my slime upon it. I can do no more. Thus it always fares with the beautiful in this world, said the poet, and he made a song upon it and sung it after his own fashion. But nobody listened. Then he gave a drummer two pence and a peacock's feather and composed a song for the drum, and the drummer beat it through the streets of the town. And when the people heard it, they said, that is a capital tune. The poet wrote many songs about the true, the beautiful, and the good. His songs were listened to in the tavern, where the tallow candles flared, in the fresh clover field, in the forest, and on the high seas, and it appeared as if this brother was to be more fortunate than the other two. But the evil spirit was angry at this, so he set to work with soot, and incense, which he can mix so artfully as to confuse an angel, and how much more easily a poor poet. The evil one knew how to manage such people. He so completely surrounded the poet with incense that the man lost his head, forgot his mission and his home, and at last lost himself, and vanished in smoke. But when the little birds heard of it, they mourned, and for three days they sang not one song. The black wood snail became blacker still, not for grief, but for envy. They should have offered me incense, he said, for it was I who gave him the idea of the most famous of his songs, the drum song of the way of the world, and it was I who spat at the rose. I can bring a witness to that fact. But no tidings of all this reached the poet's home in India. The birds had all been silent for three days, and when the time of mourning was over, so deep had been their grief 
that they had forgotten for whom they wept. Such is the way of the world. Now I must go out into the world and disappear like the rest, said the fourth brother. He was as good-tempered as the third, but no poet, though he could be witty. The two eldest had filled the castle with joyfulness, and now the last brightness was going away. Sight and hearing have always been considered two of the chief senses among men, and those which they wish to keep bright. The other senses are looked upon as of less importance. But the younger son had a different opinion. He had cultivated his taste in every way, and taste is very powerful. It rules over what goes into the mouth, as well as over all which is presented to the mind. And consequently this brother took upon himself to taste everything stored up in bottles or jars. This he called the rough part of his work. Every man's mind was to him as a vessel in which something was concocting, every land a kind of mental kitchen. There are no delicacies here, he said. So he wished to go out into the world to find something delicate to suit his taste. Perhaps fortune may be more favorable to me than it was to my brothers. I shall start on my travels, but what conveyance shall I choose? Are air balloons invented yet? He asked of his father, who knew of all inventions that had been made, or would be made. Air balloons had not then been invented, nor steamships nor railways. Good, he said, then I shall choose an air balloon. My father knows how they are to be made and guided. Nobody has invented one yet, and the people will believe that it is an aerial phantom. When I have done with the balloon, I shall burn it, and for my purpose, you must give me a few pieces of another invention which will come next. I mean a few chemical matches. He obtained what he wanted and flew away. The birds accompanied him farther than they had the other brothers. They were curious to know how this flight would end. Many more of them came swooping down. They thought it must be some new bird, and he soon had a goodly company of followers. They came in clouds till the air became darkened with birds, as it was with the cloud of locusts over the land of Egypt. And now he was out in the wide world. The balloon descended over one of the greatest cities, and the aeronaut took up his station at the highest point on the church steeple. The balloon rose again into the air, which it ought not to have done. What became of it is not known, neither is it of any consequence, for Balloons had not then been invented. And there he sat on the church steeple. The birds no longer hovered over him. They had got tired of him, and he was tired of them. All the chimneys in the town were smoking. There are altars erected to my honor, said the wind, who wished to say something agreeable to him, as he sat there boldly looking down upon the people in the street. There was one stepping along, proud of his purse, another of the key he carried behind him, though he had nothing to lock up, another took pride in his moth-eaten coat, and another in his mortified body. Vanity, all vanity, he exclaimed. I must go down there by and by and touch and taste, but I shall sit here a little while longer, for the wind blows pleasantly at my back. I shall remain here as long as the wind blows, and enjoy a little rest. It is comfortable to sleep late in the morning when one had a great deal to do, said the sluggard. So I shall stop here as long as the wind blows, for it pleases me. And there he stayed. But as he was sitting on the weathercock of the steeple, which kept turning round and round with him, he was under the false impression that the same wind still blew and that he could stay where he was without expense. But in India, in the castle on the tree of the sun, all was solitary and still, since the brothers had gone away one after the other. Nothing goes well with them, said the father. 
They will never bring the glittering jewel home. It is not made for me. They are all dead and gone. Then he bent down over the book of truth and gazed on the page on which he should have read of the life after death, but for him there was nothing to be read or learned upon it. His blind daughter was his consolation and joy. She clung to him with sincere affection, and for the sake of his happiness and peace she wished the costly jewel could be found and brought home. With longing tenderness she thought of her brothers. Where were they? Where did they live? How she wished she might dream of them, but it was strange that not even in dreams could she be brought near to them. But at last one night she dreamt that she heard the voices of her brothers calling to her from the distant world, and she could not refrain herself, but went out to them, and yet it seemed in her dream that she still remained in her father's house. She did not see her brothers, but she felt as if it were a fire burning in her hand, which, however, did not hurt her, for it was the jewel she was bringing to her father. When she awoke, she thought for a moment that she still held the stone, but she only grasped the knob of her distaff. During the long evening she had spun constantly, and round the distaff were woven threads finer than the web of a spider. Human eyes could never have distinguished these threads when separated from each other. But she had wetted them with her tears, and the twist was as strong as a cable. She rose with the impression that her dream must be a reality, that her resolution was taken. It was still night, and her father slept. She pressed a kiss upon his hand, and then took her distaff and fastened the end of the thread to her father's house. But for this, blind as she was, she would never have found her way home again. To this thread she must hold fast, and trust not to others, or even to herself. From the tree of the sun she broke four leaves, which she gave up to the wind and the weather, that they might be carried to her brothers as letters and a greeting, in case she did not meet them in the wide world. Poor blind child, what would become of her in those distant regions? But she had the invisible thread, to which she could hold fast, and she possessed a gift which all the others lacked. It was the determination to throw herself entirely into whatever she undertook, and it made her feel as if she had eyes, even at the tips of her fingers, and could hear down into her very heart. Quietly she went forth into the noisy, bustling, wonderful world, and wherever she went the skies grew bright, and she felt the warm sunbeam, and a rainbow above in the blue heavens seemed to span the dark world. She heard the song of the birds, and smelt the scent of the orange groves and apple orchards, so strongly that she seemed to taste it. Soft tones and charming songs reached her ear, as well as harsh sounds and rough words thoughts and opinions in strange contradiction to each other. Into the deepest recesses of her heart penetrated the echo of human thoughts and feelings. Now she heard the following words, sadly sung. Life is a shadow that flits away in a night of darkness and woe. But then there would follow brighter thoughts. Life has the rose's sweet perfume with sunshine, light, and joy. And if one stanza sounded painfully, each mortal thinks of himself alone, is a truth, alas, too clearly known. Then, on the other hand, came the answer. Love, like a mighty flowing stream, fills every heart with its radiant gleam. She heard, indeed, such words as these. In the petty turmoil here below, all is vain and paltry show. Then came also words of comfort. Great and good are the actions done by many whose worth is never known. 
and if sometimes the mocking strain reached her, why not join in the jesting cry that contemns all gifts from the throne on high? In the blind girl's heart a stronger voice repeated, To trust in thyself and God is best, in his holy will forever to rest. But the evil spirit could not see this, and remained contented. He has more cleverness than ten thousand men, and he found means to compass his end. He betook himself to the marsh and collected a few little bubbles of stagnant water. Then he uttered over them the echoes of lying words that they might become strong. He mixed up together songs of praise with lying epitaphs. As many as he could find boiled them in tears shed by envy, put upon them rouge which he had scraped from faded cheeks and from these he produced a maiden in form and appearance like a blind girl, the angel of completeness, as men called her. The evil one's plot was successful. The world knew not which was the true, and indeed how should the world know? To trust in thyself and God is best, in his holy will forever to rest. So sung the blind girl in full faith. She had entrusted the four green leaves from the tree of the sun to the winds, as letters of greeting to her brothers, and she had full confidence that the leaves would reach them. She fully believed that the jewel which outshines all the glories of the world would yet be found, and that upon the forehead of humanity it would glitter even in the castle of her father. Even in my father's house, she repeated. Yes, the place in which this jewel is to be found is earth, and I shall bring more than the promise of it with me. I feel it glow and swell more and more in my closed hand. Every grain of truth which the keen wind carried up and whirled towards me, I caught and treasured. I allowed it to be penetrated with the fragrance of the beautiful, of which there is so much in the world even for the blind. I took the beatings of a heart engaged in a good action, and added them to my treasure. All that I can bring is but dust. Still it is a part of the jewel we seek, and there is plenty. My hand is quite full of it. She soon found herself again at home, carried thither in a flight of thought, never having loosened her hold of the invisible thread fastened to her father's house. As she stretched out her hand to her father, the powers of evil dashed with the fury of a hurricane over the tree of the sun. A blast of wind rushed through the open doors and into the sanctuary where lay the Book of Truth. "'It will be blown to dust by the wind,' said the father as he seized the open hand she held towards him. No, she replied with quiet confidence. It is indestructible. I feel its beam warming my very soul. Then her father observed that a dazzling flame gleamed from the white page on which the shining dust had passed from her hand. It was there to prove the certainty of eternal life and on the book glowed one shining word, and only one, the word, Believe. And soon the four brothers were again with the father and daughter. When the green leaf from home fell on the bosom of each, a longing had seized them to return. They had arrived accompanied by the birds of passage, the stag, the antelope, and all the creatures of the forest who wished to take part in their joy. We have often seen, when a sunbeam burst through a crack in the door into a dusty room, how a whirring column of dust seems to circle round. But this was not poor, insignificant, common dust which the blind girl had brought. Even the rainbow's colors are dim when compared with the beauty which shone from the page on which it had fallen. 
the beaming word believe from every grain of truth had the brightness of the beautiful and the good more bright than the mighty pillar of the flame that led moses and the children of israel to the land of canaan and from the word believe arose the bridge of hope reaching even to the unmeasurable love in the realms of the infinite end of the philosopher's stone